India is working towards introducing what is known as digital currency. The currency will be referred to as the e-rupee and is intended to make payments much more efficient. E-rupee voucher digital transaction ko aur prabhavi banane mein bahut badi bhumika nibhane wala. China has created its own form of digital currency known as the digital yuan. Well, the Federal Reserve announcing it's taking another step at looking at the possibility of issuing a central bank digital currency. RBI ne wholesale ke liye launch kiya digital rupee ka pilot project. Hi everybody, on 1st of November 2022, the Reserve Bank of India launched the pilot for something called the Central Bank Backed Digital Rupee, which is the Central Bank Digital Currency of India. And this digital rupee is a very, very big leap in establishing the next generation financial system for India. And what is even more important to note is that it's not just a big deal for India, but even for China, France, Switzerland and America because of which all of them are in the race to crack the code for the central bank digital currency. But just like always, while every single news channel wrote sensational headlines about CBDC, very few of us actually told us what exactly is the central bank digital currency and how will it affect the lives of the common people like you and me. So in this case study, let's do a deep dive and try to understand what exactly are the central bank digital currencies called the digital rupee, digital dollar and digital yuan. How is this system different from all the existing modes of payment that we already have in our system? What are the most important applications of the central bank digital currency? And most importantly, what are the most authentic sources to give you a deeper understanding of this concept of central bank digital currency? The first thing we need to understand is the basic concept of money and where does CBDC fit among all other forms of instruments that we already have in the modern day society. Now when Shubham gives Ajit a note of 100 rupees, what he's really giving Ajit is a promise by the RBI to pay Ajit who's the bearer of the note 100 rupees. So the 100 rupees note is a legal tender which means it can be used to pay for any transaction in India. Now CBDC does the exact same thing but in the digital format and just like a 100 rupees, a central bank digital currency is a form of currency note issued by the central bank. It's just that instead of the physical form, it is in the digital form. So it's not backed by a physical commodity such as gold or silver, it's only backed by the government that issues it. So instead of printing money, the central bank issues electronic coins or accounts backed by the faith and credit of the government. So central bank digital currency basically fulfills the functions of money as a medium of exchange and store of value. So you can practically exchange this 100 rupees of digital rupees for a physical note of 100 rupees. Now the question over here is, this is just like sending money digitally via UPI, right? Then how is CBDC different and how will it work? Well, if you look at the system from the consumer perspective, it's very, very similar. But from the banking standpoint, it's completely different. For example, let's take the case of Paytm. When I buy chips and I pay 100 rupees via Paytm, my payment wallet is linked to my bank account. So this money will be debited from my bank account and will be credited to the shop owner's bank account. So on the front end, I get a notification saying 100 rupees has been sent. And at the same time, the shopkeeper gets a notification saying money has been received. But guess what? In reality, this money has not been received by the receiver's account at all. Why? Because the way the system functions the backend is that instead of immediately transferring 100 rupees every time someone sends 100 rupees, what these banks do is they settle the delta of transaction on a periodic basis. For example, let's say 1 lakh HDFC customers sent 250 crores to ICICI merchants and ICICI customers sent 100 crores to HDFC merchants. So instead of transferring and updating every single transaction, they will wait till the end of the day and transfer the net amount to each other. So in this case, since HDFC customers sent 250 crores to ICICI and received 100 crores from ICICI customers, at the end of the day, HDFC will simply send 150 crores to settle the transaction with ICICI. So you see, although the ledger entry of the transaction happens instantly, the actual transaction takes a day or a week to be executed. So if this is very, very clear to you, let's come to the central bank issued digital rupee. Now, when I buy chips worth 30 rupees from my account in the RBI, the money will directly go to the grocery owner's bank account with the RBI. So both the front and back end transaction will take place almost immediately and simultaneously. And the transaction is now in the RBI's ledger. 
So just like cash, the money gets transferred from me to the shopkeeper. It's just that the same transaction has happened in the digital format. Now in CBDC also, there are two types of CBDC. Wholesale CBDC, which is meant for banks and retail CBDC, which is meant for consumers like you and me. So the question is, with everything working perfectly fine in our current system, why do we need to transition to CBDC and what are the problems that CBDC will solve for India and the world? Well, this is what brings me to the three superpowers of CBDC. The first superpower that digital rupee brings to the table is the power of something called smart contract. For those who don't know, smart contracts are self-executing contracts with discrete terms of agreements between two parties. And this agreement is directly written into the lines of code. And the classic example to understand the superpower can be seen with the example of the Finnish refugees. People did you know, as of 2020, the world refugee population stood at 82.4 million individuals. And these are the individuals who got forcibly displaced as a result of persecution, conflict or human rights violation. And out of this humongous population, barely 5% will actually get asylum this year. And when they get asylum, most people think that their struggle ends. But you know what? It just gets started. Even after taking asylum in a particular country, the proof of identity takes weeks, sometimes even months and years to be processed. And since these people have to start from nothing, the government is to provide them with certain provisions just so that they can survive in the country. And here's where another problem arises. Most people do not get their documents at all, so some of them try to forge the documents and try to misuse the government's provision by forging their identity. And refugees don't get loans at all. Why? Because the bank has no record of their past behaviors. But you know what guys? In Finland, these people have done such an amazing job with refugee settlement that the refugees in this country are happier than the citizens of most country. And in Finland, instead of traditional cash disbursements, the Finnish immigration service partnered with a local startup called Moni and they handed out prepaid mastercards to these refugees. This mastercard was specifically designed for asylum seekers who do not have a bank account. So let's take a very simple example to try and understand the magic of the smart contract system. If John is an asylum seeker, then the government will program his mastercard such that in the first year, he'll be eligible for a 30% subsidy in essential commodities and 5% subsidy for gas. In the second year, he'll be eligible only for 20% subsidy in essential commodities and 3% subsidy in gas. So as time passes, automatically, his MasterCard will get updated in such a way that when he goes to pay for his fuel using his MasterCard, he will automatically receive only 3% subsidy. And when he does the same for grocery, for essential commodities specifically, he will get a 20% subsidy. And this smart contract could be so sophisticated that it can also put a limitation such that tomorrow if John's income exceeds $10,000 for 6 months consecutively, then automatically the smart contract will revoke the subsidy because now John is rich and he no longer needs a subsidy. In addition to that, there is also a wonderful feature called the circle of trust. And the way this works is that if John borrows or sends money to his friends through his card, all his transaction will get recorded and he will get a credit score based on his behavior. So if he consistently pays back all the loans that he's taken from his friends, the credit score of John will go up. At the same time, if he is a cheapo who never returns the money, then his credit score will go down. And all this data gets documented on the blockchain and becomes extremely useful for the government and the banks that would lend money to these refugees like John. Because like we saw, asylum seekers arrive in a new country with zero credit history. And this smart contracts calculation of credit score gets them in a position wherein they can borrow money from the financial institutions. And this is being done with the vision that in the next 5 to 10 years, these very same asylum seekers should be in a position to go and take loans so that they can go on to build a business of their own and eventually go on to contribute to the economy of Finland. The best part is that everything including the proof of identity, government subsidy access, credit scores, loans and salary disbursements, all these processes are done on blockchain in an efficient, transparent and automated manner. And this exact same thing can be done with the central bank digital currencies. So this digital rupee is a wonderful tool that can be used for a variety of conditional subsidies in India. This could be for food subsidies for people adversely affected by natural calamities, for people seeking education subsidies or reservation, or even for people seeking micro loans. This is the first superpower of the central bank digital currency. And this brings us to the second superpower CBDC, that is its ability to take financial inclusion beyond the geographical limitation, unbanked population and offline transactions. 
You see guys, while most of us take the availability of physical cash for granted, what we fail to realize is that the rest of the world and even in our country, there are geographical areas where making physical cash available is a very very big challenge. Let's take the case of Bahamas. This country in the Caribbean introduced CBDC in 2020 called the Sand Dollar. Now if you look at the geography of the Bahamas, it consists of 700 scattered islands. So even if you have a well-established financial system, it's a half day or a full day trip just to get to the bank. But using the Sand Dollar, which is their central bank digital currency, the cash is transferred digitally which makes it extremely easy for people to access money. And guess what, you don't even require a bank account to make CBDC payments. In our context in India, here we have a huge chunk of population that still does not have a bank account. But still, they have access to mobile internet. And here's where the opportunity of CBDC lies. Because with CBDC, even an unbanked Indian consumer with an Aadhaar number and a smartphone can easily make a transaction. This way, CBDC increases the scope of integrating people into the financial system who were traditionally outside of it. This also helps RBI track more amount of cash in the system and even facilitate easy availability of credit to these kind of people. And since it can be used offline, digital rupee can be accessed in regions with poor or no internet connectivity at all. So in short, two people with no ATM, no third party app, no bank account can make a transaction with each other with the CBDC technology. This is the second superpower of CBDC. And this brings us to the third pillar, which is the ability to pay remittance in a cost efficient manner. People remittance are basically the funds that migrants send to their relatives in their home country while working and living abroad. For example, a person working in the US sends home a part of their salary to his or her parents in India. And because of the exchange rate, it makes the cash have more purchase power in India. And did you know, India is the largest recipient of remittance in the world and we received $87 billion in 2022. Currently, remittance are made through international money transfer operators like Western Union. And these cross-border transfers are very, very expensive. They charge 2 to 3% in commissions and take 3 to 5 business days for the transfer. So first of all, it's very, very costly for the migrants. And for the businesses, it takes away their profit margin itself. So through the current system, if you want to transfer 100 crore, your pay will have to wait for 3 to 5 business days. And this is a lot for a 100 crore rupees transaction. Because if 5 of your clients are to pay you 100 crore each, do you realize 500 crores of your money is a lot of working capital to be stuck for 3 to 5 business days. On top of that, 3 to 5% charge on 100 crores is 3 to 5 crore rupees. So if your business makes a profit margin of 12%, you will lose 3% of your profits merely with cross-border payments. But this is why, ladies and gentlemen, the digital rupee is expected to lower the remittance transfer costs, eventually making it easier for the Indian diaspora to send funds to India. And this brings us to the last question and that is, how will CBDC model work and is it good enough to actually replace the SWIFT system? Well, I don't know what's substituting the SWIFT, but currently there are three models based on which the CBDC cross-border payments could happen. The first model of CBDC is very similar to SWIFT, whereby there'll be two central bank systems of respective countries. They will have their own payment rules, own rules of governance and their own technical infrastructure. But when they have to transact with each other, there'll be a private clearing system for clearing services. And this is very similar to Visa and MasterCard for credit cards. The second type of model was experimented in 2019 by the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Bank of Canada. As a part of this project, the CBDC networks of Singapore and Canada were linked up by synchronizing payment actions without the need for a trusted third party or a common platform. Basically a decentralized clearing service. And the third model is where we have multiple CBDCs but the central banks would agree on a single rulebook, single set of participation requirements and build the supporting infrastructure in collaboration. Now, which of these models clear the test of technological feasibility, traders' disability and market viability? Only time will tell. But the one thing that's for sure is that the country that cracks this CBDC code first will have a huge upper hand over the rest of the world. And the one ahead in the race right now is none other than China. So if China is able to bring down the time of transaction to 1 to 2 days and the commissions to 1 to 2%, then China will go on to possess the financial superpower for the next century. And this brings us to the last part of the episode and that is about the study materials to help you understand the concept of CBDC and the power of the central bank digital currency better. But before we move on, I want to thank our partners IDFC First Bank who are one of the nine banks that RBI has identified for the participation in the pilot of the digital rupee in the wholesale market. IDFC First Bank is on a mission to create India's most customer friendly bank. How? 
Most banks credit interest on the savings account in India on a quarterly basis and this has been happening for more than 75 years since independence in 1947. But IDFC First Bank is a new age customer friendly bank which credits interest to customers on a monthly basis. It may not seem like much initially, however, when your account is credited interest monthly for the next month, you earn interest on the interest earned in the previous month in addition to earning interest on the principal. This is the power of monthly compounding. So with every passing month, your savings will keep on growing faster. For example, when you open a savings account with an average balance of 5 lakh rupees, with most other banks, you would earn an interest of 3% per annum on a quarterly basis. And this will earn you about 15,000 rupees at the end of the year. However, for the same amount with IDFC First Bank's savings account, you get an interest rate starting at 4% per annum payable monthly. And this will earn an interest of 20,371 rupees at the end of this year. You see, this is a whole 34% higher interest on the same amount of balance, which means an extra 5,000 plus rupees at the end of the year as compared to most other banks. At higher slabs, this difference is even more pronounced. That's not all. Usually, banks charge fees to customers on variety of services, say for non-home branch transactions, cash transactions at branches, IMPS, RTGS, NEFT, SMS alert charges and a lot more. But IDFC First Bank charges zero fees on 25 such services under their customer first policy. So if you're interested in a monthly compounding at higher rates and drastically reduced fees, check the link below to open your account and experience the joy of earning more than your savings through the power of monthly compounding. Moving on to the study materials, the first thing I'm attaching is the concept note of RBI itself that will help you understand every single detail, type and possibilities of the digital rupee. The second thing I'm attaching is this Twitter thread by Anshul, which will give you an oversimplified understanding of CBDC and its application. And lastly, I am attaching an Atlantic Council article that will give you an in-depth understanding of the international race for the central bank digital currency. So do have a look at them and let me know what you think. And when all these digital currency projects are in works, you can open your IDFC first savings account and get incremental value through their customer centric products through the link in the description. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube ever happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.